Hi there, uh, my name is James. Uh, this is a little project that I'm working on at the moment in podcast format. Uh, so I'd like to welcome my first guest, Phil Golding. Thank you. Um, you're a counselor, psychologist, practitioner. Um, why don't you uh, give yourself your mm. title? So. Yeah, I'm a uh, transpersonal psychotherapist. Yes. Um, with the same um, level of experience, qualifications as a psychologist. Yes. And um, I'm also a podcaster, and I teach yep. mindfulness and uh, meditation. Yeah, and you host your own classes, and yeah, which, I run run meditation groups, which and, I've been a part of, and has been really helpful to me as well. So, good. yeah, I met you about nine to ten months ago when I first came here from New Zealand, mm-hmm. um, and I remember you just helping me out through a hard time. So I appreciate that. Mm. And um, along the way, I've come to know that you have a lot of uh, materials that you've made by yourself over you know your the breadth of knowledge that you've accumulated over your uh, career um, and so I just wanted to interview you to get to know you better and introduce maybe some concepts that uh, people can benefit from um, in the world so I thought we'd just start off with your background and how you uh, how you got into a uh, meditative space into a greater sense of consciousness I suppose what, what's your story that you said that you um, got into a bit of a rut or depression um, yeah so by the time I was halfway through my last, you know, senior year in high school. I was um, really breaking down. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I couldn't concentrate it at school. I couldn't concentrate on my, you know, schooling anymore. And so I ended up leaving school halfway through that year. I okay. just dropped out. Yeah. I didn't ask my parents permission or anything. I, I just dropped out. I couldn't couldn't um, do it anymore. I just, you know, I, I just wasn't interested. I wasn't fitting in. Yeah. I was just. How did they react it. to that? How did you? Uh, well, they weren't happy, but um, my father had his own business. Yeah. Um, a, a small sand mine, operating the local builders and things like that, and supplying them. Yeah. So I end up labouring for him Helping for a while. Out. Yeah. And um, but then a friend of mine's dad got me a job in a pathology lab. Okay. And um, which was nice. I got to wear a white coat and feel important yeah. and, and and be a lab assistant. So I then end up going to Sydney to do a, a course as as a pathology technician. But it wasn't right. me. And so by the by the time that year had finished, I was in the same space really. And so I dropped out of that. Yeah. Moved back to my hometown, which was Tamworth, okay. and my parents had retired by that stage and had moved to the coast, but they still had their old house. Right. And um, and which was being rented out at the time, and they agreed to let me stay in in the caravan, which was still in the backyard. Right. But okay. um, that's when my depression was really kicking in by that stage so mm-hmm. I was there on my own isolated uh, a little bit yeah it was I guess I felt like a failure you know and I just didn't know what to do I didn't know how to launch myself yeah. into the world because I didn't know who I was or what to launch myself with mm. and so yeah and I started to feel quite suicidal mm. around that time yeah. Um, weekends I'd come alive because I wasn't unemployed. I could kind of be a, a normal, regular person. Yeah, yeah. But then, uh, and I would go, you know, um, motorbike riding with my mates, and yeah, and um, which end up pulling me out of that situation mm. because I end up having a motorbike accident and um, had a head-on with a car on a on a dirt road. Wow. And um, my foot was between the <laughs> car and the bike. Oh, and no. so that pulled me out of being unemployed and, and being, you know, yeah. recovering and waiting for an operation to just to, to sort my foot out a bit. So and that even heightened the level <laughs> of isolation a bit? Yeah. 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 Um, well, no, actually, no, okay. because it, it, it pulled me out of being a failure I was I was recovering right. you know what I mean so it gave me something different to do oh, I see and I ended up moving back to my parents place mm, okay and and or to my parents new place or old place because they built a long time ago it was their holiday home right. and so on the coast on the coast yeah. and um, so I recovered 
had my operation uh, and then moved to Brisbane um, mm -hmm. because a travelling commercial art show was coming through um, doing murals on cars. You were doing that? Uh, well, that's what I was doing and I was good at art. Mm. And so I ended up doing that course and, and excelled yeah. and, and so I went to Brisbane to work with them. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and they turned out to be a bit dodgy so that didn't work. But that, that's what brought me to Brisbane. Mm. And, um, and so I just had various experiences and... and and yeah, well, it's it's a range of different experiences without committing to one in any sort. So. Yeah, again, I d had no idea. Yeah, you know, I mean, how, how old were you during that process? Uh, this was in my yeah early twenties. Early twenties, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so that. Um, doing the murals and that then led me just into spray painting, yeah. and then that led me into a, a trade. Yeah, so and, um, yeah, just trying new things, seeing what you like. Yeah, yeah. And so, but then I um, end up meeting a, a lady, and during that period, um, who um, was an alcoholic. Mm. I didn't really understand that at the time. Mm -hmm. But then we got um, involved and, you know, and eventually and got married. And, um, but I thought I was going to solve her alcoholic problem, you know. And um, so yeah. I got busy trying to save her. And, and Right. To maybe also get away from your own problems a little bit? Well, it certainly, yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. But uh, it was also really part of my nature yeah which I didn't really fully understand at the time mm, but, um, yeah. but of course all I did was in trying to save her get on the roller coaster ride with her right and um, and eventually it got to a point where the alcoholism was getting quite bad mm. she was starting to <clears throat> get affected by alcoholic poisoning Oh, wow. um, so seeing doctors and, 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 and trying to encourage her to go into rehab mm. and um, I ended up seeing a, one of the counsellors at the rehab yeah. and you know and, and I had a good counselling session with him and, and it kind of woke me up to the fact that um, she's an adult her life was her responsibility mm. and you know and helped me to see that all my attempts to save her were futile <laughs> you know yeah. all I was like I said all I was doing was getting on the roller coaster ride with her so I was able to go home and um, just gently give her life back to her without dumping a guilt trip without trying to manipulate or control I just gave it all back Mm. And um, and that, in a sense, like I was not enabling anymore. I wasn't, you know. Yeah. Because the more you try to get in and control and save, you end up, you know, getting blamed. But the other, but the the, the dependent person ends up relying on that. And, yeah, that's right. That's. And so my handing her life back to her, I think, you know, um, put the gravity of her situation a bit more into her awareness. Yeah. And yeah. um, within a couple of weeks, managed to get her into rehab. Mm, okay. and, um, and she got 12-stepped um, by some AA members there. Yeah. And, um, and you were still so, useful with her during that process? Yes, yeah, that's okay. right. And so she got on with her, <clears throat> um, you know, AA journey and quite excited about that. Um, but then my depression was still waiting for me. Mm. You know, and you know, and it was quite clear that um, you know my life was still going nowhere. I still didn't really know, you yeah. know, what I was doing or where I was going. Mm. And um, but I took it along to one of the open AA meetings. So she'd never car license at the time, and um, and that was a revelation because. It's, as soon as I saw the 12 steps banner up on the wall yeah. and had a bit of a read of it, it just seemed to spark some intuitive knowing in me. Mm. I just instantly knew it as, as a path to personal 
development transformation awakening, yeah. even though I really had no real awareness about that. Mm. Because yeah. there was no real deep inquiry or self-reflection in my family of origin. Interesting. Uh, my parents weren't thinkers. Yeah. And um, and um, my elder brother and sister weren't thinkers. My next brother up, we we would talk about stuff, but he was also the one bullying me, and right. and so there was we could connect, but there was conflicting, yes. challenging yeah. aspects there. So there was nothing in my family of origin or my education that really reflected. Mm. you know, my potential, who I was, what, yeah. what I could do in the world, you know. But it seemed even <laughs> then you had um, a sense of, yeah, that intuitiveness and in knowing this personally deep within you, but it, once you went to that 12 step and you saw them actually written down, you could actually feel like um, this was something that you were interested in maybe? or it, Yeah, it just sparked something, of a knowing, you know, yeah. something familiar about it. Yeah. And... Um, you know, and the fact that, you know, I was so devoted to trying to, you know, save my wife yeah. from the alcoholism rather than saying, you know, this is crazy, I'm, I'm just getting out of here, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, but it took me probably another six months before I went and found my own 12-step program. Mm. And so I, I could see that this was an opportunity and so I inevitably end up finding my own. What 12 step did you need because... Oh. Well, the avenue of, of being married to an alcoholic, even though she was now sober, you know, gave me the opportunity to join Al-Anon, which is for family and friends of alcoholics. Oh. So I end up um, joining Al-Anon, which is for family and friends of alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the second biggest uh, 12 step program. Yep. And um, and so, but I, you know, wasn't there to get my um, partner sober because she already was, and which is often why people end up in al on but they soon discover that we're there to start getting our own life back together and, and, um, yeah. and give the other person's life their back, their life back so they can yes. start taking responsibility for their own stuff. Yeah, because of uh, the dependency. Um, would you say it's kind of like a codependent relationship? Yeah, that's right. And Alan really helped you break out, break out of, of that codependency. Yeah. But for me, I, I um, used it for my own personal development. So I, you know, and so I was struggling with my depression. And, and so, um, yeah, so I was using the, the 12 steps to, to start to look at myself. One thing about the depression, was it an underlying feeling that you constantly had all the time and that you didn't recognize or name it or label it, but it just existed? Or did you know that this is like what I have right now is depression? I wasn't very trusting in terms of I never went to a therapist or talked to a doctor about it. Um, but I, all I knew it was that I would easily feel defeated. And, um, but I would also feel that, that there was something important for me to do, but I had no idea what it was. And so I did not know how to launch myself into any direction. And so I would tend to just implode. Mm. And so... Um, Addictions weren't useful to me. I, I tried alcohol when I was young, but that that didn't give me any euphoric feeling. All it did was make me feel sick and <laughs> throw up, and and so you know, of it didn't, didn't make me feel any better. So that didn't work. Same coping mechanisms exist today. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I um, I slept and watched TV. That was my coping mechanism. I just would veg out. And, what would you watch on TV? It's just anything. Just anything, yeah. I mean, at the time, Australia was losing to the West Indies on cricket, so well, that, that was good to suit my mood. Back when the West Indies were good, yep. You know, but when I was in you know, my parents' backyard in the caravan, that's what I would do all week. I would just sleep. Right. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and so 
um, you're in this Al Al-Anon group. Yeah. And uh, is is there anyone who kind of uh, reinforces this uh, desire in you to change, or is it is it a long process of self reflection? Well, the whole point of the you know twelve step program is to go through the steps and, and go through the program and. And all, all the meetings are about sharing that and sharing our experiences. And, and the meeting is often focused on a particular step in your range through the 12 steps. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and the first step is admitted we were powerless over our goal and our lives have become unmanageable, you know. And, and that, that's an acceptance step, really. You know, it's accepting that I, I haven't got a clue, you know. Oh, I don't know what is going on. Yeah. Uh, the second step is kind of believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Now, you know, I was learning these steps, and um, <clears throat> but there was something else going on too. That intuitive part of me was was, was taking part of the process, was a part of that process. I didn't really fully understand that at the time, yeah. but everything was really quite easy for me to understand. Mm. And I seemed to get a lot more out of the process and really um, was necessarily there in the process. It's hard to explain, but I just had a lot of intuitive knowing, and so the, yeah. the, the 12 steps was just a nice vehicle to awaken that. Yeah. And so, you know, I was keen to understand the, the steps and the whole process, and so I really, you know, studied it and, and, and just kept diving into it until I really understood it and understood why it works. Mm. What, you know, and... Um, and I noticed also that, um, you know, the, the, the other members around me, you know, when I was, um, you know, got to know certain other members, they would, you know, struggle with the concepts and, and mm. find learning stuff hard, whereas it would just like be second nature to me. Yeah. So that's, you know, so some first, um, I guess, experiences of some natural, you know, intuitive Mm. awareness that I had okay. and, um, but again I still didn't know <clears throat> that that was going to be a career path or a vocation yeah. as yet but I was certainly learning about you know how to heal the mind yeah. and how to be able to face myself turn around and, and face my depression mm. was there any one step where you just had like a, a particular revelation in the 12 steps or? Well, it was, the, I wouldn't have been in the beginning, you know, the, the first few years to be able to explain in any real clarity why it was working. <clears throat> but um, what it certainly did in the whole, you know, embrace and atmosphere and ethos of the groups and the, and the program was about acceptance. It was an unconditional acceptance mm. of you as a person. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and really mentored me into accepting myself as I am. Okay. And, um, and which enabled me to start looking at myself. And so that leads you into, I think, step four is make a searching and fearless uh, moral inventory of yourself. Mm. It, it's a little bit of old language because I think it was developed around the 1920s. Right. But, so, um, yeah. but it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's self-inquiry. Yeah. Like that's, it, and that promotes personal responsibility yeah. for your own mind, you know, for what, what your mind is doing to your life. Mm. But at the same time, it does that with self-acceptance. And yeah. so that enabled me to turn around and start to have a relationship with my own mind. Mm. Um, but not be beaten back by all my self-judging, which mm. is ultimately what was causing my depression. I was just corralled in yeah. by self-judgment, thinking I was a failure in some way. Right. And so right. I would, looking back, I would, um, you know, I was a dreamer, so I'd have big dreams about, you know, where I wanted to be in life, but then 
um, without even knowing it, turn on myself because I didn't know how to achieve that. Mm. This is very common um, with people today, especially uh, because of social media, seeing so many other people and careers that are out there. This, the, the influx of, of the range of opportunities is too overwhelming, and you feel like you could be doing something that other people can be doing, but you don't know how to do it, and you can't give yourself any agency. Um, just being overwhelmed. So um, yeah. I understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Well, and this was before social media yeah. <laughs> existed. But um, computers only came into being when I was going into university, actually. Very recent. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm 63 now. So, but um, but nevertheless, you know, all the social pressures were there and, and pressures to succeed and, and so on. But, you know, the fact that I would get caught in this loop where, you know, I'll think about launching myself and then um, it was like, you know, I thought my bus had left and I'd missed it, you know. And But why? Why? That really wasn't, um, you know, there was challenges in my family of origin, but um, but it didn't really fully explain mm. why that depression was there. But I didn't really understand at the time. But... Um, you know, working on myself, working on my relationship with myself and and, mm. and learning how to be my own best friend. You know, this was going, you know, making big strides in, in learning to free me up and, mm. um, you know, get me functioning again. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in, in total, <clears throat> how long were you in the al program for? I was there for about um, 10 or so years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when was it when you came to realization that uh, you wanted to pursue transpersonal psychology? What, what are the steps in between that yeah. and then getting Yeah, to that was, you know, probably after around that 10-year mark. But what I, um, what I had the opportunity to do was to, after about eight years in the, the program, you know, I was functioning really well. Um, I was still in my trade, but, you know, um, working that, you know, to quite well. And, um, but whenever I tried to step out and do something different or move ahead in a different way, the depression would, would kick back in again. So every time I tried to step out in centre stage, it just triggered self-doubt. And um, I would, you know, can, you know, keep encountering that depression. So I had an opportunity to um, just spend a, a bunch of weeks doing nothing but focusing on that. And so, right, you know, mm. I've got this time my own. I'm, I'm going to get all my tools and work through this. And so I did. I did a lot of journaling using the tools that I had. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the acceptance, personal responsibility, taking total ownership of what my thoughts were doing to me and looking at my various relationships with my parents and and, and my siblings and, and you know, the, the, the conditioning, mm -hmm. you know, that I was gaining. And uh, in terms of, you know, how that was affecting my self-acceptance and so on. Right, and so, you, so you took two weeks to sit down and unravel all the yeah. aspects of your life. And did you know intuitively how to kind of structure this in a way? Yeah, because I had the process. So, yeah. I, you know, I used the tools, yeah. uh, the step four tools. And then the, and so, you know, I just kept working with it, but in terms of deeper and deeper and deeper self-acceptance. And I just had a, a sense of, oh, you know, like I got to a point where self-acceptance needs to be unconditional like you know it was there but the, the, the fundamental level of self-acceptance is something unconditional like which is kind of radical to our normal thinking hmm. like you know we all think oh unconditional love oh that's important but do we really understand what that means you no. know the fundamental nature of it Mm. You know, to, to try to actually, you know, live by unconditional love. It is, it's just you encounter challenge after challenge after challenge. But 
to accept myself unconditionally. Something just, just clicked in me that, well, hang on, that's something I have total power over. This is my relationship with myself, not with somebody else. Mm. I'm not relying on somebody else to love me unconditionally. You know, I can't control that. I can't. Yeah. But I can, you know, embark on that loving myself unconditionally. And so there's, I, I just got to a, an understanding that my only requirement to be worthy was to exist on that level. Mm. So, um, I was able to grasp a, a fundamental enough level of self-acceptance where um, my depression just fell apart. It just psh, dissolved. Um, and I was expecting it to come back at some point, you know, but it actually never did. Mm. And I came to realise after a while that I got to a point where the old programming that, that kept the depression going had been dismantled sufficiently. Mm, okay. Well, can you talk more about the programming aspect? Well, I didn't fully understand at the time. That came a bit later. But um, because so much of it was unconscious, that the, the self-condemnation, the self-judging was so un under, underneath my consciousness that I really wasn't fully you know, aware of the, the mechanisms behind it. And all I knew that I wasn't accepting myself and, and yeah. you know. And so once I got down to a, d a depth of self-acceptance, <clears throat> there was, uh, it just prevented that, that old program from functioning anymore. Mm. I would have the same challenges and the, and the same emotions would come up. Yeah. Um, but when the thought would come up to, you know, judge myself or condemn myself, um, there'd be nothing reinforcing it anymore. I wasn't identifying with those thoughts anymore. You, you took the power away from it, yeah. Yeah, because my identity now was accepting myself unconditionally. That, that's a big one, I guess, is the identity that you wanted to have or, like, mm -hmm. you thought you were supposed to do amazing things and then you just ripped out that sense that you need to be someone and then you yeah. just accepted yourself in the moment. Yeah. yeah, so basically I got to a point where I didn't have to do anything to be worthy. That's it. You know, it's... so I freed myself of all that, all those constructs that were, you know, you've failed, you haven't measured up to this, or I haven't done that, and therefore you've, you know, you're not worthy. And so basically, you know, my own mind was kept casting me out of life, if you like, you know, okay, you haven't measured up. I know? think that uh, in Western culture, this is kind of the procedure that we have to go through, like especially as talking through childhood conditioning, through school system. We have to be someone, get out of school, get a job, and then that way you have acceptance by your peers and your mm. family. Um, and you have, you know, I guess you have a goal as well. Um, and you have a sense of identity through that. And as long as you keep trying to pursue something, the, the problem is that something is outside of yourself. Yeah. And so I guess it's a part of our conditioning being a part of this uh, Western society as well. Yeah, indeed. You know, yeah. And for most of us, it works good enough. You know, we can manage to control those elements good enough and, and keep distracted in those. Um, but either we, you know, have trauma or conditioning that becomes too problematic and that gets in the way of us trying to actualize ourselves and, and build our life and we keep hitting a wall mm. and it's that suffering that that causes us to have to look within yes and um and so that was happening for me i was trying to launch myself i couldn't even get to the starting line of launching myself yeah you know before it would keep start kicking in and so yeah and do you think if you had that acceptance back then uh you would have made different choices oh, of um, course yeah, yeah. But i think that the what was happening here though was was um you know my own um desire to know how it works my own desire to um develop myself to heal and to grow um, was largely an intuitive 
thing as well. And so, um, so where we moved on from here was I started to realize that like in, in the 12-step program, as you become experienced, you start to mentor those less experienced, you know. Mm. And so by this stage, I was, you know, what's called sponsoring, you know, other members and, and um, you know, and uh, it was my happy place. Yeah. You know, and it was, a, it was a natural thing for me. And I, I could see that, you know, I could reach people and, and I really enjoyed this. And, um, you know, it got to a point where I realized um, you know, counselling, you know, could be a useful um, mm-hmm. avenue yeah. to go down, and Absolutely. so then that that took me into a, an actual, um, you know, learning and an in inquiry avenue mm. into psychology and, and um, yeah, and when I started delving into psychology, <clears throat> I went straight into existential psychology. Mm. Um, Again, from that intuitive perspective, um, they don't even really, they don't teach existential psychology much at university because it's a very ex- experiential. What do you mean by existential psychology? Okay, existential psychology is <clears throat> um, like the likes of Viktor Frankl, um, who. Man's search for meaning. Yeah, the man's search for meaning who started his, you know, um, self-inquiry journey in a German concentration camp as a, as a, as a, as a Jew. Yeah. And um, but he noticed um, that those who accepted life and didn't see themselves as a victim but accepted the circumstance in the present moment and did their best to work with it, fared much better than those who were fighting against their conditions and seeing themselves as a victim and and hating the abuser and mm-hmm. so all of that would be bringing them down and, and affect their health and right. so he just noticed that that you know, that level you know that radical level of acceptance mm-hmm. enabled a far greater resilience yeah and so existential psychology is very much about accepting the reality of life, not arguing with it, not fighting with it, but flowing with it. Mm-hmm. So it, it faces death, it, it faces anything that is going to cause you fear or anxiety or insecurity. You turn around and you face it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> just as a kind of side topic is, if you're supposed to accept your situation as it is mm. and you have a goal and you know that you're not you know very functional or productive as you are as yourself yeah. how do you make that um, step-by-step process to getting to your goal is it actually inquiring yourself and seeing if the goal is realistic or if it's actually what you want or well, it's also accepting the fact that you're getting in your own way of the goal <laughs> so this is back to accepting yourself. Yeah. And part of my accepting myself is I had to accept that I kept suffering depression. And so instead of trying to get away from the depression, um, which the, the 12-step program, you know, was a great gift for me because instead of trying to get away from it, it enabled me to turn around and start getting into it. Mm. Yeah, the, the the fact when we try to get away from the depression, take pills to, to try to fix it, and, you know, we're, in a sense, afraid of the depression. We're afraid of the, mm. you know, we're afraid of our own mind, if you like. Yeah. So we're in conflict with it in, in the way we, we are giving that malady power. Yeah. So instead I was able to face it, accept it, not judge myself because I had depression, but to really go in like a scientist with a clipboard and go, well, isn't that interesting? Let's see what's going on here. Mm. You know what I mean? And as you <clears throat> opened, um, as you would say, Pandora's box, yeah. then you found that the depression didn't have any grounds to stand on. It just disintegrated. Well, once I got to a deep, a depth level of self-acceptance, mm. 
Yeah, because when the old program came up, the new program of unconditional, that radical level of self-acceptance came up with it and just neutralized it. So this is the power of acceptance. This is why we've got to bring it to the fundamental level of total self-acceptance. It's not self-indulgence, because what was coming with it was total personal responsibility. This is my mind. Mm. And on the parent of my mind, as an adult, the mind belongs to me. Mm. But it's a, it's, we've got to treat it as a living thing, like our own child. How are we going to parent the child with unconditional love? But we take responsibility. Yeah. for that child, you know what I mean? We teach the child responsibility. Mm. And, and so it just enabled me to really grasp those two principles and put them to work, mm. to align my awareness to those principles and then face my mind yeah. with that clarity, with that approach, which um, had the power to literally dismantle Mm. that programming that was very, very unconscious. Mm -hmm. But because I was willing, I was able to face myself, therefore face the self-judgments, but from the perspective of self-acceptance. Mm. And so that would, I would know, I would see the self-judgment, I would feel it, but I was no longer believing in it. Mm. I was no longer identifying with it. And so I came to understand that the mind will only keep going with its program so long as me as awareness keeps believing in it and reinforcing it. Mm. And that's the position of the ego. The ego is, our, ego is our potential for awareness, for consciousness, but it's captured by the mind and serving the mind, so it can't get above the mind. Right. That's why the ego gets a bad name. And so the ego is identifying with those programming, with that conditioning, mm. with that blind conditioning, you see. But, and it is blind. Yeah, the ego is blind. Yeah. Yeah. But see, once we take the position of total self-acceptance and total personal responsibility, that is the very opposite to everything in my mind that's causing me to suffer. Mm. So I suddenly wake my awareness up, my ability to observe myself. This now part of myself is in a different position to my conditioned mind, yep. which enables us to be in a different position, perspective, to mm. observe ourselves from. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and we'll we'll get back into that. But yeah. um, so you you were saying you went to university and you were studying existential psychology. Um, no, I was just studying normal psychology. They don't because existential psychology can only really be understood by by living it. Right. You know, by facing death, if you like, and surrendering to it. Yeah. It's not a give up. It's it's a stop fighting reality. And yes. It's yeah. an ego death process. Mm. And so, you know, you, you, you can't intellectualize your way through that. You just, it's a letting go. You have to confront it. Yeah. yeah. It's simply looking at reality, pointless arguing with reality, let go to reality. Let, you know, it, it's, mm. it's, even, it's a struggle to even talk about, you know. Your construction of reality. It's about letting go, yeah. Yeah. That's a total acceptance, total personal responsibility. Mm. You know, okay. it's, it's no good blaming the world for what my mind is thinking. Yes. Mm. You know, the mind, once we're an adult, it's understanding once we're an adult, the world doesn't make us think. Therefore, the world doesn't make us feel or say or do the things we, we do. We do. It's, it's coming from our own power, whether that's conscious or unconscious. Mm. And then you get into a victim mindset where <clears throat> you, you believe you don't have any agency in yourself and that's how you get to depression again. Yeah, to yeah. the degree that you blame something outside yourself for what you're thinking and feeling is the degree that you're not going to have any control over it. Yeah, but in reality it's probably, it's probably a mix of the two. It's probably a mix of the environment around me has conditioned me to um, be a certain way as well as I'm not trying hard enough. Or I'm not. It's, it's, it's challenging because, you know, the normal world, let's say, is 49 to 51% insane. So therefore, I mean, they don't really teach existentialism that much at university because you've got to live it. It's, it's a process of letting go. 
mm. letting go of you know futile control. Yeah. Okay. But um, and so you know I was learning psychology. Um, I ended up learning. Um, well, my first stint at university, I I was doing psychology. I, I got in at a, at a country university. Um, I didn't have a big range of subjects. I wanted to. I was doing a Bachelor of Arts, so I wanted to get a wider range of subjects. So after the first year, and I did pretty well, yeah. I bridged back to Brisbane to one of the major universities and, and doing psychology there. But then I hit a wall because um, the psychology of that university was very dry, very research-based, mm. and I'm more feeling-based and intuitive-based. Yeah. And um, and so I, there I had to be excited about statistics, and and um, it, yeah, it just wasn't... Why do you think they very, structure it that way? Um, it was just re- more research-orientated. And, um, and so and it didn't facilitate my stream of psychology, which was... Yeah, which was more humanistic and more existential. Yeah. So, um, but I end up cutting that out of a single major, the psychology, and, and dived into the comparative religion department, mm. which is not theology, but it, it's exploring um, spirituality and religion in all different ways. So I could study Buddhism, Hinduism, um, and mysticism, and, and Jung and Freud and. And, and, so, and why did you take that part? I was just interested in more depth, more meaning, and um, uh, depth psychology is, is one of the terms for it. Um, and really it, it was transpersonal psychology for me. It was an opportunity to keep exploring psychology through those particular streams, but from a spiritual and consciousness perspective. Yeah. And so... So it gave you that balance. Yeah. yeah, and so therefore I, um, I didn't come out as a fully qualified psychologist, but I came out with a, with a lot of tools, and um, but I'd already knew how to heal my mind before I even started, mm. because I'd already done yourself the, yeah. that healing, which was very useful because it helped me to um, get the most out of it, but also yeah. helped me understand that mainstream psychology was still. Um, you know, working on the surface of things so much, which made it so much more complicated. But if you just go into the depth mm. and get to those two principles of total acceptance, total personal responsibility, yeah, that would be tweaking it right down at the fundamental causes of things. All of this stuff would start getting taken care of by the shifts that would occur down at this I level. I mean, you wouldn't have meditations and uh, obsessions at university, would you? No, and there's no self-inquiry either. Yeah. You can go through mainstream university, through undergraduate, master's, doctorate, never have to look at yourself. Well, that's the thing. You're playing for a status game as well at the same time. I guess for, so. For those who pursue that uh, it is it, it's it's yeah it's become a bit like a religious doctrine in some ways in into the conservative aspect of it but you know but at the same time you know mainstream science is important it's grounding yeah. and and you know it's important to understand and learn the scientific method mm. you know empiricism yeah. and, and things like that you got to get your feet on the ground mm. you got to be able to see things with clearly Yes, but at the same time, it, it you know it, it put thing in, in into a box, and I wouldn't look outside that box. Mm. And um, your own personal path um, really isn't included in it. Yeah. And in transpersonal psychology, um, your own personal path is very much central mm-hmm. to that. If you can't evolve yourself, then yeah. you know, and so that ability to face yourself and, and to break down your own ego and awaken that yeah. into awareness. Absolutely. I think mm-hmm. it is very important. I mean, to me, that's where I've learned most of my um, experience and knowledge. Mm. And um, yeah. the university was frameworks and, and mm. you know, ways to articulate things. It's, um, yeah, speaking to the intellect. 
um, but not the emotional intelligence, I suppose. Well, um, when it comes to the, the real deeper alchemy of things, yeah. um, you only learn that by the initiate, initiation of facing your own fears, insecurities, mm, and okay. breaking through that. Yeah. You, you know, your ego, you've got to learn how to die on an ego level to let go yeah. of those fears, insecurities, attachments and aversions. Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. So, so therefore, um, once I finished that stint of university, um, you know, I, I was ready to, to start counselling, but I wanted um, something um, spurred me on to want to develop my own process or define um, the active process that, that enabled me to heal. And so that's when I sat down with, you know, with in my on my computer and started to define the the, the essential process that, that I understood. Mm. And break it down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then from there, uh, yeah. How did you specifically get into transpersonal psychology? Is there a pathway for that, or? Um, in Australia, there's no real university level transpersonal psychology degrees. It's just, it's more a case of you're approaching psychology from a more spiritual perspective, a consciousness transformational perspective, and understanding also that <clears throat> we're all on a path of evolution of our own consciousness. Yeah. And so we're not just here to live, consume, and die. You know, we're, we're here to evolve, mm. to learn, to grow. Yeah. And um, that doesn't stop just because you're an adult. That, that consciousness growth and doesn't stop. And it's, it's, it's learning the mechanisms of how to make that happen. And are there specific tools that um, differ from transpersonal to uh, then regular mainstream psychology? It uses all the same, um, you know, it can encapsulate all that's in mainstream psychology, but yeah, it, it, goes, it goes deeper. Mm. And um, how to explain that? Yeah, it's difficult, yeah. Well, oh. Um, for me, how to explain that is back to total acceptance, total personal responsibility. I mean, that's the red pill that you give to Neo that breaks him out of the matrix. That that's mm. and um, what my studies and pursuits of learning inside and outside university um, led me to was an integrative study of the various wisdom paths. Mm -hmm. Not so much religion, but focuses on wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so studying that from Hinduism, Buddhism, um, the Jewish Kabbalah, which is the wisdom aspect of it, the, the Sufism, which is the wisdom aspect of the, the Muslim traditions. Well, it makes sense to take wisdom from ancient uh, people, the way they lived. And if it survived this long into our society, I think it deserves to be studied as well. Yeah, but the, the wisdom path is uh, meaning wisdom, meaning, um, you know, personal transformation that, you know, how each culture was able to define the keys that unlocked our right. potential to evolve. And you saw all the patterns mm. that existed within uh, those, and, and 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 many other people have been, you know, doing that integrative study, and and of course they were coming up with the fact that everyone was saying the same thing. Once you understood the symbolism and the cultural, you know, language and so on. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, what works works. It's a physics. That's right. Yeah. And lo and behold. Total acceptance, total personal responsibility <laughs> just kept coming up. Yeah. And I've never found those principles contradicted. No. They are universal. Mm. Yeah, no, that's very important. And um, how many, so how many years of uh, counseling did you do um, after graduating? Um, well, um, um, it's been about 25 years 25 now. 25 years, yeah. From counseling. Yeah. 
Well, that's brilliant. And yeah. um, if you want to talk a bit about um, your your book that you have and how yeah. that came into into being. Well, let's track back a little bit because um, when I sat down to um, define that process, that the five steps pretty well come out straight away. Mm. And so, I, I um, my intuition and the um, all that I've been learning, you know, just seem to come out in in that simple process that I'm still using today. Mm. And so it started off as, as just a, a little essay on the, the, the five steps and then that turned into a booklet and then eventually that turned into a book, which okay. is now the second edition of that book. Yeah. So that the whole thing was written from not just an academic perspective, but a purely, you know, a very much an experiential. Mm. Um, and then um, from the experience of using that as a therapeutic process with with my clients and students. Mm. And so, and yeah. uh, again, it, it, it's, it's proved its effectiveness yeah. in those five steps of continued to evolve but but remain throughout that whole thing um and going into depth and i'm looking forward to going into depth with you more about it in the future mm. um but would you like to just talk about your book for a minute and, yeah. Uh, yeah um second edition of my book five steps to freedom path to inner harmony so this is the the book here my um five steps to freedom path to inner harmony and personal growth this is the second edition there's about 20 odd years of development in this yeah. through my own path and then you know working with others for all that time yeah and so all, so all that the wisdom is you were talking about help so. you heal and grow and so it really introduces you to the five-step process and how to put it into practice in your life beautiful and um and then there's also my podcasts i've got three podcasts on you know, series at the moment a fourth coming very shortly so uh, the first is Real Healing, Real Awakening. I did that quite some years ago. The latest one is Five Steps to Freedom. Yep. And, um, and uh, then I've got a, a series of med guided meditations, which I'm still adding to, and as well as the Five Steps to Freedom. I'm just starting a Quest for Healing series as well, so focusing on things like um, trauma, depression, anxiety, and specific um, topics like that. More more specific topics, yeah. Yeah, and okay. understanding those things and, and how to heal them, overcome them. Brilliant. And on top of that, you've got a healing meditation center that you run as well? Um, yeah, I run meditation, mindfulness groups. Cool. Self-awareness groups, yeah. You can just probably find it on, on the website, on your website. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's all on my website, innerharmony.com.au. Brilliant. Awesome. Well, thank you for all your knowledge, Phil. I appreciate it, and I look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you, James. All right. Look forward to it as well.